Hollow Knight is probably my favourite indie game I've ever played. Made by Team Cherry and funded through Kickstarter, I had the pleasure of first playing Hollow Knight earlier this year and the art direction immediately grabbed me. Then came the fluid combat and that is aided by the splendid score by Christopher Larkin. Hollow Knight is not just any Metroidvania 2D platformer, it's a piece of art. The game is set in a grim underworld of dangerous, humorous and strange inset characters. Team Cherry have impressively merged various elements of story, art style, combat, balance, progression systems and environments to create something I can only call a complete game. Hollow Knight manages to strike the balance of casual and veteran friendly difficulty that many games lack. The game presents challenges in a perfect balance of various jumping puzzles, enemies, punishing roguelike death mechanics as well as checkpoints. Powerful unique bosses drive the player to learn how to tackle each battle effectively. If you feel as though the game needs more challenge, there's the Steel Soul mode, in which you have one life to get through the game in one life, or you start the game from the beginning again. The level design in this game is also fantastic and hits the highs of navigation that only a well designed Metroidvania can achieve. The progression system has a level of freedom where players can tackle bosses and new zones without sequential order. Locations can be reached via multiple paths provided by a feeling of non-linear freedom through interweaving worlds. Areas can always be returned to when new gear is found and stats enhanced. The level of difficulty is familiar to Dark Souls in the aspect of learning patterns and adapting to various enemies. But no, this is not the Dark Souls of platformers, it's something much more. Each area feels completely different to traverse and explore. The map is gigantic and the music in each zone gives that specific zone its own auditory character. Each zone is distinct by new enemies, music, traps and layouts with previous explored zones changing as the story progresses. Hollow Knight's Metroidvania-esque approach excludes the usual pixel art style. The art style feels more immersive and distinct due to lack of pixelization. The style of Hollow Knight is dark, creepy and desolate, although contrary to always feels lively. The various characters and dialogues are humorous, creepy, rude, mysterious and full of character that ensures the world does not feel barren, even in the darkest and most dangerous depths. Each enemy is uniquely different, having barely any issues of reskins or similar movesets, so each new combat encounter feels fresh. Although it's not obvious at first what the story is about until the players start searching, there's no significant push to learn the story until the player begins decoding the cryptic messages presented around Hollow Nest. The boss fights in this game all have their own positives and negatives, but each one has the player utilise the skills and abilities that they have picked up across their journey through Hollow Nest to their advantage, whether it be the elegance of Hornet, the power of Fallen Knight, or Nightmare King Grim. I must hand it to Team Cherry and how they handled the DLC in this game. All the pieces of downloadable content came at no additional cost of the already cheap $15 price tag, and each piece added more and more to the base game, which makes it hard to ignore this effort. The small development team cares about the game, and that goes a long way in today's AAA filled bullshittery. Overall, even though I only played Hollow Knight earlier this year, it left an impact on me that sets it aside from other games released this generation, and I always find myself returning to Hollow Nest whether it be for the music, the boss fights or level design. It is because of the care and detail that went into this game that I find it has to be on my favourite games of this generation. When God of War was revealed back at E3 2016 I was full of anticipation. The series was shown to be going in a completely new direction than the usual hack and slash that the series had become known for, and instead was looking more akin to The Last of Us. This God of War starts Kratos on a new journey that a new player to the series can dive straight into, but also rewards those who have followed him on his previous outings which involve Kratos facing off against the gods of Greek mythology. One thing that's made this game special to me is that it takes someone who is almost irredeemable in Kratos, and makes this god human. Kratos, the epitome of vengeance who powered the excellent God of War games in the noughties, is an absurd candidate for such humanisation. Until now, his sole character trait has been angry. In his game, he is retired to Midgard, is recently widowed and father to a son who knows nothing of his god-slaying, blood-soaked past in Greece. He and the boys set out to scatter his wife's ashes from the top of a distant mountain, getting unwillingly caught in the upping the affairs of the Norse gods along the way. 
This god of war wants us to see Kratos as a person, rather than an instrument of extraordinary violence. This game not only pulls this off, but turns Kratos and his son's journey into one of the best games of recent years. A deft intertwine of relatable familial drama and an awe-inspiring mythological epic. This is vastly different from the previous entries, in which Kratos can best be known for using a woman as a cog-stopping mechanism, and his biggest character development came from deciding which violent and gruesome way to destroy a certain god that had drawn his eye at that moment in time. That is not to say I did not enjoy those games. I loved them, and played them on multiple times, even the PSP ones. But it did feel as though there was a limit to where Kratos' story could go, and that it had a lifespan. This game does away with those worries. The odd thing about the reboot, though, is it would not be as good if the previous games hadn't been like that, because it benefits so much from not only subverting your expectations, but also showing real character growth in Kratos. It's a slow burn, and for a while it seems like it's not going to happen at all. But God of War features one of the best character arcs in any video game character I've seen. It doesn't do this through endless lengthy cutscenes, but instead through gradual change. Small comments and changing reactions to events and other characters that you meet. It's subtle, and it's realistic. And while the other characters can be a little bit more abrupt in how their stories pan out, it's still handled very well. It's not just the story and Kratos who have changed, the gameplay has also had a massive overhaul. This combat is not as overblown as it once was, but it still has a very violent game. With deliberate, intense fights against creatures ranging from the frozen and dead to building sized dragons. It is exhilaratingly brutal. Every hit has heft, and most enemies are a threat. Kratos doesn't punch, he pulverises. He moves like a boxer, shoulders set, legs grapevine and back and forth. The way his axe zips into an enemy's skull, and then back to his hand is so smooth and natural, it's easy to overlook how challenging it must have been to animate such a thing. His son, Atreus, who once holds back tears when hunting a deer in one of the game's first scenes, gradually becomes more accomplished with a bow and helpful in confrontations. There are perhaps not quite enough enemy types and to last the whole run in time though, including a strange lack of boss battles when compared to the previous outings, but everything else is perfect for me. Long way from home, aren't you? What do you want? Oh, you already know the answer to that. Now, when talking about boss fights in this game, it's hard not to discuss two of my favourite bosses, not just in this game, but of all time. The first of which is Boulder, the game's primary antagonist, which takes place within the first few hours of the game. And let me tell you, this sets the pace for the rest of the game to come. Upon first contact, Boulder does not seem like a match for Kratos, but then the first punch is thrown. You might as well be seeing a battle on Dragon Ball Z. These two gods throw everything at each other, and destroy everything in their way, whether it be trees, rocks, or even full-blown mountains that crack and crumble under their colossal battle. This boss fight helps you become more accustomed to the new combat system, especially on Gimme God of War difficulty. But the next boss fight to be mentioned, make sure you have mastered it. Of course I can only talk about the Queen Valkyrie Sigrun. Sigrun throws everything at you, and you need to make sure you can throw everything back. Sigrun is the result of battling through all the previous Valkyries hidden behind Odin's chambers, and for good reason. Sigrun has everything that made the other Valkyries difficult and uses them to her benefit. She is called the Queen Valkyrie for a reason. I'm not gonna lie, she kicked my ass for longer than I'm proud to admit, but it's for all this trial and error figuring out what runes work best for what situation, and to last the full length of the fight without making any mistakes, made me fall in love with this boss. Funnily enough, she alongside all the other Valkyries are all optional. Now, when not fighting, you are exploring the reaches of Midgard via the Lake of the Nine, whether it be on foot or by boat, finding temples and ruins that take inspiration from Norse mythology. Treasure chests and mythological texts are hidden in places that need brain work rather than brawn to unlock, encouraging the player to look around and feel present in the world. The axe is frequently put to alternative use in these puzzles, freezing mechanisms in their place or thrown to flip switches or destroy sigils. Comprehending God of War's memorable places is as satisfying as sinking the axe into a demon's skull. Alternating between thinking and fighting gives God of War a rhythm that can be absorbed in hours at a time. This relaxing pace frees you to explore and it frees Kratos to focus more on parenting than saving the realm. On more than one occasion he threatens a bratty Atreus that he will turn his canoe around and head straight back home. It feels like he might actually do it. The game is one continuous shot, with no interruptions. Irritating necessities such as loading screens are hidden so effectively you barely realise they are there. This cinematic commitment to Kratos' point of view enhances the story's efforts to humanise him. You walk in his boots, flowing between combat, story scenes and exploration without interruption. There are abundant moments of outstanding beauty, canoeing between the rusting legs of an ancient statue of Thor and onto a lake, traversing the bodies of fallen giants, 
entering the temple to find cavernous treasure packed chambers, resplendent works of virtual architecture. It's among the most impressive video games ever made, and trust me, my PS4 Pro also knew it. The dialogue in the game is also a standout for me as it feels real. Atreus talks like a kid, sweet and also selfish, and Kratos acts, in turn, like a father who has no clue how to be a parent, and yet feels a profound need to protect his boy from the world and his own bloodline. God of War is awesome at times, in the true sense of the word, but its heart lives in the small ways this man and his boy are building and rebuilding their relationship. God of War is a story about what it means to be a god, traversing realms, killing mythical monsters, exerting power, exploring the boundaries of possibility, but also about what it means to be a man. Power and masculinity intertwined, and Kratos' desire to protect his son from the narratives of both is touching. Atreus is far from the irritating psychic he might have been, complimenting Kratos' gruff and humorless dialogue with quips and endearing observations, turning his father's intense seriousness and their ability to find humour in anything into a running joke. Their dynamic changes shape more than once over the course of the story, and their relationship involves a lot more demon blood and magical artefacts than the typical parent-child relationship. But Kratos is still a distant, emotionally remote father trying clumsily to reach out to a son who feels unwanted. God of War sits at number 4 Spotless Generation, which is no small feat in itself. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is not only at number 3 spot because I think it's a fantastic game, but because if I did not play this game it's entirely possible I would not have played all these other great games that have made the list and others that have not. The story of the game is simple. The titular Witcher, Geralt of Rivia, is on a quest to find his adoptive daughter Ciri, who is being pursued by the Wild Hunt. And, to complicate matters, Ciri is also the real daughter of Emery of Ar Emrys and is the sole princess of Sintra. The game branches out from this quest to find Ciri, and you soon find yourself in a world that is teeming with various side quests and interesting characters to interact with. There's a really good example of this approach at the very beginning of The Witcher 3. In White Orchard, the tutorial area where you stalk a griffin, there's a little house down by the river. An elderly woman is outside, claiming that the person in the hut borrowed her frying pan but never gave it back. Your job is to find a way inside to investigate on her behalf. Sure enough, the pan's inside. Conducting a little investigation around the hut's interior reveals more details. There are burned papers in the fireplace, and some of the writing is still legible. As it turns out, a particular crafty spy had borrowed the pan because of how dirty it was. He scrubbed it clean and used the soot to write a coded message. But that's not the cool part. On the floor, you'll see a smashed silver monocle. One of Geralt's companions from a previous Witcher story is well known for wearing such an accessory. And when you meet him much later on in the game, you'll find out that yes, he was there in that exact hut. There's more to the story than pans and soot. It appears the whole ordeal is in part of an elaborate and ongoing plot to assassinate a king. However, you could have just ignored her, but the throwaway hint was there. Now these types of quests are littered throughout the world of the Witcher. One side story with a seemingly inconsequential decision but change how number one plays out 50 hours later. You'll have no idea how important it was until you eventually witness the whole cycle in action. A monocle could reveal identity of a spy, while a random monster hunt you hear about by accident could later turn into a multi-hour side quest. This is where The Witcher sets the bar for open world game design. This game is full of unforgettable moments such as arriving at Hangman's Tree in Velen, to the entire Bloody Baron quest, to the Battle of Kaer Morhen. There are also little moments to be enjoyed also, such as helping rid of a supposed haunted house, only to find the one causing all the hassle is a little godlin who only wants some company. These moments are where the writing really shines. It's no understatement to say that the writing of every character is brilliant. I can't remember ever spending as much time in a character's journal as I did in Geralt's. A close second would be Arthur's. In The Witcher 3, I consulted it regularly, always checking for updated character logs and rechecking when I come across new people. And there are dozens of them. All of them are interesting, all of them are different, and none of them are superfluous. One quest line where the writing shines is the Get Junior storyline. Awesome Junior is probably the most hateful and disgusting character in all of Witcher 3, a good and traditional cunt to rival Joffrey in Game of Thrones. Every scene he's in, he's awful, 
but in such a grotesquely fascinating way that you can't help but enjoy watching him. Now, the main story can be a bit predictable at times, but it never takes away from the impact from the more tender moments, such as finding Siri for the first time, and then letting her go at the game's climax. One of the biggest complaints I see regularly in regards to this game is the gameplay and how clunky and stiff it is, and I will agree to some extent. Is it the free-flowing combat of the Arkham games? No, but it doesn't really need to be. Many other games have tried this type of crowd control, one game I picked out for this comparison is Assassin's Creed Odyssey, another game that involves big crowds, swords and spells, but for me The Witcher 3 achieved much more. In this there's less fumbling around with the controller trying to attack the person you want to attack, finishing moves feel brutal. You get the sense of being an expert swordsman and the magic powers feel more potent. I like how they're focused on the 5 unique abilities that you can upgrade and tweak, ever so slightly depending on your playstyle. This playstyle allows for specific builds when playing. You can focus on potions and the prep work that goes into a hunt, not too dissimilar for Monster Hunter, or focus on a Quen shield build with the Ursine armor of the Bear School. These choices, much like the quests that accompany them, allow for multiple playthroughs. Also, perhaps the best gameplay mechanic in the game? Motherfucking Gwen. The best game within a game ever be made that is so addicting you actually forget about the task at hand and your sole focus becomes becoming the best Gwent player in all the land. Now, it would be hard to talk about the game without acknowledging the game's two excellent DLCs that accompany it. The first being the Hearts of Stone, which tells the story of Old Geard von Erich and his deal with the menacing Gaunter Odin, who is sometimes called Master Mirror or Man of Glass, who is a former mirror merchant that Geralt encounters early in the game. Odin has a mysterious aura that surrounds him, which is already a sign it would be trouble for Geralt later in the game. What follows is probably the best quest in the game, only contested by the Bloody Baron storyline, full of intrigue and had CD Projekt Red firing on all cylinders. Everything in this DLC is top quality and nothing feels tacked on. It was one of the quests I jumped into as soon as I could. Gaunt Road Dim is just so menacing. The second is Blood and Wine, which takes Geralt to the land of Toussaint, the most vibrant of all areas in the game. And whilst it does not match Hearts of Stone from a story perspective, it makes up with it it makes up with it with pure gameplay alterations and embraces the wackiest side of the Witcher story. Nothing will ever top Geralt completing a quest alongside his loyal steed Roach, whilst engaging in full back and forth conversation the entire time. Blood and Wild's greatest achievement is giving Geralt the perfect send off that he deserves. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is a game that is very special to me and will always have a special place in my heart, for it introduced me to and showed me that what great game development can achieve and continues to achieve to this day. The only reason it's not at the top of this list is because multiple playthroughs have allowed me to look at it in a more critical point of view, and there are some things that do hold it back for me. But this is not a video about those issues. This is a video about my games of this generation, and there's no way in Crookback Bog that this title would not have been at the top of the list. Bloodborne is one of the best games this generation, and anyone who's played it would probably tell you the same. Everything in this game blends together so perfectly to create an amazing experience that you will not forget once you learn to fear the old blood. By the blood. Undone by the blood. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. Every recent entry from FromSoft, spanning from 2009's Demon Souls right until their latest release, Sekiro, which I talked about earlier, is a bona fide classic, hence why two of their games end up on this list. But Bloodborne is the best of the bunch for me. There is something special about your first experience wandering the cobbled streets of Yarnum. Yarnum is fraught with peril, with maddened denizens jumping out from behind a coffin, being an early indication that From Software isn't above jump scares in the game, that's a world away from the dark fantasy of Dark Souls. But more in depth to the gothic horror of both Victorian literature and H.P. Lovecraft. While your first steps in a Souls game are always cautious, never knowing what dangers are around the corner, you at least have a shield to hold in front of you, a barrier between you and the terrors that await. But such luxuries are absent in Bloodborne. When you do finally come across a flimsy wooden board, it comes with a gentle trolling message. Shields are nice, but not if they engender passivity. 
This message personified Bloodborne's combat system. There is no passive waiting for your enemies to make their move. But instead, Bloodborne's approach is a hectic and frenzied approach to combat for its trick weapons. Each weapon has two approaches to combat that can be utilised like combos in a fighting game. Deftly blending the transformations to deliver more violent and damaging attacks to your enemies. In the place of the traditional shield is a hunter's trusty sidearm. While not powerful enough to kill an enemy, the blast of a blunderbuss can stagger back a crowd to let you catch a breath. But real mastery comes from shooting at just the right time to parry stun your enemy, leaving them open for a brutal and bloody visceral attack. Parries are always a tricky thing for me to do with certain shields in Dark Souls, but no other means to defend yourself in Bloodborne, learning this timing becomes absolutely essential against virtually any foe, especially against early boss Father Gascoigne. Mastery is only one facet of what makes Bloodborne so richly compelling. Discovery is just as important. Yarnum may not be as huge as the Labyrinthian Lordran, but the Great Ones is perhaps the attack of Miyazaki's greatest achievement. Not just filled with environmental storytelling, but literally hiding secrets in plain sight. Or, should I say insight. A mysterious mechanic that you initially believe is little more than a number in the corner of the screen. Your insight increases during your time in Yarnum, such as when you defeat a boss or you consume an item called Madman's Knowledge. Increased insight allows you to access a new shop in your safe hub area, the Hunter's Dream, becoming a currency for acquiring rare items, or as a way to summon other hunters into your world when things get too overwhelming. But, allow your insight to increase further, and it starts ramping up the difficulty, with its real power allowing you to see and hear things that you couldn't before. To certainly realise that there have been higher beings watching you all this time, Cathedral Ward is an astonishing moment, making you question what just what else the game is hiding. There are really just so many secrets that one playthrough isn't enough. The scares might dissipate, but that just emboldens you to investigate Yarnum's depths, seeking out an NPC you didn't meet before, or find out how to befriend a particular foe. All of it combining to form an intricate picture of Yarnum and its inhabitants. Those yearning for greater challenges can also descend into the procedurally generated chalice dungeons, which lacks the authored designs of the main game but still conceals monstrosities that you wouldn't find otherwise including a few thoughts to have been excised from the game altogether. Bloodborne isn't just one of the greatest games of this generation, it's one of an all-time great. A large part of that greatness is that Miyazaki's uncompromised vision, a singular masterpiece that is not bound by the sequelitis that accompanies the Dark Souls trilogy. Though it would be hard to discuss Bloodborne without mentioning its spectacular DLC, The Old Hunters. Let me just preface this by saying, in my opinion, The Old Hunters DLC is the best piece of additional content ever made. So in addition to a masterpiece rather than a blood sucking season pass. The Old Hunters is a perfect expansion for Bloodborne and, like Artorius of the Abyss for Dark Souls, adds a wonderful whole without taking anything away. The Old Hunters is set in the Hunter's Nightmare, a self-contained universe where blood crazed hunters raise perpetual war and never ending flow of beasts. From the off you're phasing blood crazed hunters armed with a variety of trick weapons, which leads to a new taste in Bloodborne's world. In the DLC's initial stages, they will mix up beasts and old hunters, which, as natural enemies, will go for one another. This is a joy sometimes to just sit back and watch hunters in their natural element, decimating beasts with vicious precision before locking you in their crosshairs. This willingness to throw out an idea, base a few sections around it and then move on is what makes the old hunters such a rich addition to Bloodborne. There's something of this in the world design too. These games are known for their exceptionally engineered location design. The kind of architecture that wraps around and leads back to itself. The second of a nightmare allows the principle to be telescoped, so the old hunters are like a world in a bottle. Each location's various areas are themed and lead into the next, but the transitions are frequent and bold. The opening area is full of frenzied hunters and partially transformed beasts, with Yarnum-esque architecture overgrown and bulging at the edges from some unseen pressure. From Software's environmental artists are magnificent at managing perspective, not just in the simple sense of slightness and landmarks, but in actively curving the angles and shapes of this place to feed into your eye. The ground is not hostile to speak, but it's constantly approaching you in their path. And why the great breakout moments when you enter the open and get a great view of what's ahead have such an impact. The most memorable part of this location is the River of Blood, a cliche that is usually best left to the imagination. But this is less a river than a foetid, strangled stream and pools and congulates in corners, where fat abominations sit and slurp. Crimson smears up the banks, cakes at the edge of stairwells, 
and lightly splashes as you walk through it. Canehurst spider women, their stomachs swollen into blood sacs, sit in little clutches lapping away. You can almost smell the copper and feel how sticky your boots are. This river and this section ends with a boss, rightly touted as one of the best, the beast form of the old hunter Ludwig. Ludwig's gear is in the original Bloodborne, and we know him as the founder of the Healing Church's hunting faction. He is one of those almost heroic figures Miyazaki is so good at, a noble figure corrupted by his choices. And Ludwig's box fight is an absolute masterpiece in a game that excels at boss fights. This is an aspect that the old hunters and Bloodborne excel at, the boss fights. Whether it be the base game when facing off against Gascoigne or the Wet Nurse, every boss fight feels different, but the Old Hunters DLC has the best boss fights of the game. Each boss fight serves as a purpose, from Ludwig to Lady Maria, Lawrence to Orphan of Cos. All of them lend themselves to the incredible gameplay and world building, and this is what set themselves above the rest, not just in Bloodborne, but this generation. The world building of this DLC and how it sheds new light on the mysteries within the base game are what make it so good. This can be perfectly summed up in its final area, the fishing village. This area and how it teases out the atmosphere and texture of dead marine life leads to some of especially horrific sights. Throughout this expansion, previously existed assets are used sparingly, whether the environment, work or enemies, and this is one of the reasons it feels so substantial. The large quantity of new work is bulked out with some familiar silhouettes. Whereas a lesser developer might dilute the impact of the new, Bloodborne's approach is ingenious. The research hall reuses many of the assets from the Nightmare Frontiers Lecture Hall and Bergenworth Interior, but the latter pair are tiny areas in Bloodborne that most players visit once. Here the concept they suggest is expanded, with books and surgical fittings spread luxuriantly over several floors, while the tactile pleasures like the clattering pill and ointment bottles are given a devilish streak through their use in traps. This in turn sheds new light on what the original spaces were. With Ludwig, his heroism is already implied in the fact that his name survives in Bloodborne's world, along with the dark knowledge that the greatest of hunters becomes the greatest of beasts. So, to see him given such tumorous brute form once his once beautiful face descends across some polyp-like growth, is to see the original game deliver. Ludwig is a beast of his fate is tragic, and the soundtrack's full-throated echo of Sis theme drives the point home across parallel dimensions. The Old Hunters is the only DLC Bloodborne got. The kind of depth and richness you dream in an expansion, the locations and especially the boss fights here maintain Bloodborne's incredibly high standards and manage that magical trick of somehow enhancing the original world at the same time. The best pieces of DLC I have played are Taurus of the Abyss and now Old Hunters. From Software's approach to additional content is a lesson to every developer out there. I only played Bloodborne in the past year, but that should speak volumes just how good this game is. This game has made an impact on me and I use it as a measuring stick for all of the games. It's a meticulously detailed fantasy landscape where a single misstep can destroy you. It's a paragon of environmental storytelling, with a narrative delivered through things as subtle as the name of an enemy or the description of an item. It turns what could be a cliche quasi-Victorian landscape into something utterly bizarre, from the city of Yarnum's endless tide of crow-headed dogs and hunchback wolfmen to the fact that everything important requires, as the name suggests, Blood rocks, or blood echoes, or fermented blood, or other nonsensical blood related material. You can really defeat an enemy, only learn its pattern. Bloodborne is a satisfying exploration of repetition, thematically and mechanically. It's a single endless night of executions where nothing can truly die. Since your own death resurrects nearly every enemy in the world, the idea of a place stuck in time is a classic fantasy convention, but it's especially effective here because you spend so much time enacting a cycle yourself. You're becoming intimately familiar with every creature you kill, even when they're visibly interchangeable. Watching for the one that plays dead next to a carriage, or the one waiting to jump out from behind a wall. There's no trick for you permanently getting rid of them, just a methodical process of learning and levelling as you traverse the city over and over. The fighting them enough times once formidable enemies start to feel pitiable, incapable of the same evolution you've made. Yarnum's inertia makes every change you can affect seem monumental. Exploring the world doesn't just mean finding new territory, but also looping back constantly, opening shortcuts to your starting point. This is another filler conceit, but instead of simply being an added convenience, an open door is one of the few things that your death won't reset. Boss fights reward you with the clear progression of time, which almost feels more meaningful than any tangible benefit this allows Bloodborne 
to stand above the other games of this generation. If you know anything about me, you know I love games that blend together gameplay with a fantastic story. And Red Dead Redemption 2 has both of those things in space, and should be no surprise it was my favourite game of this generation. Red Dead Redemption 2 is set in 1899, some 12 years before the original, and when the American West was properly wild. The first game was about how one outlaw dealt with being outmoded and pushed to extinction as 20th century civilization took hold and the country was tamed, and the sequel shows the process of that taming in all its violence and turmoil. You play as Arthur Morgan, a veteran of the same group of outlaws that you hunt down as John Marston in the original game, chased across the land as they teeter on the edge of their own extinction. Now when I think of Arthur Morgan, I think of one of my favourite game characters. I think of the once right hand man of the Dutch Vanderling's gang, and by the end he is just a man searching for his own redemption in his dying breath. Making Red Dead Redemption 2 a prequel, and handling as a protagonist which was completely absent from the first game made crystal clear for us, or at least to me, that at one point in the game Arthur Morgan is going to die, and indeed that is what happens ultimately. But knowing the outcome beforehand robbed me and many others of the surprise element, though the irony here is that not, not so surprise shook me to my very core, and that is why what makes Arthur Morgan so amazing. A man of different shades, just like all of us. Arthur Morgan ain't a hero, he ain't a villain or even an anti-hero as the initial impressions indicated. He's just an ordinary person somewhere in the middle, battling the good and evil inside of him just like all of us are doing. What separates him from almost every other character in video games is how intricate his personality is, hands down the best rockstar character ever made. But why would you care for a dead man walking? Add to the unprecedented expectations set by Red Dead Redemption's one, John Marston, who is more of a hero type when compared to his confused personality of Arthur. Rockstar Games answered this by the layers of depth Arthur's character held and a marvellous performance by Robert Clark, who voiced and motion captured the man. As we progress through the story and traverse the huge and beautiful open world of RDR2, the layers started to unravel and we the players started to get into Arthur's mind and soul. I guess uh, I'm afraid. As we ventured forward, we explored his traumatic past, his relationship with his former lover Mary Linton, his love for writing, hence the reason he kept a journal, being a father figure to Jack when John was busy getting his shit together, the guilt of losing his former kid Isaac whom he couldn't protect, the little moments he spends with his horses, patting and feeding them, caring as if they were just another lost human soul, his loyalty towards Dutch till the very end and of course his caring attitude towards every single member of the gang, even Micah as he went to Strawberry to rescue him in spite of his personal grudges because they were all one big family. And family meant everything to him, all he ever cared for. I gave you all I had. I did. He would write whole actual diary entries about a 50 hour campaign, sketching memorable scenery and reflecting on the state of affairs of his chosen family, people he once knew, oscillating between hope and despair as his fortune changes. It's entirely optional reading, but a refreshing intimate take on a traditionally masculine figure who harbours as many doubts and hopes as the next person. He will sing to himself on lonesome rides and to cry his aging body in the mirror. He'll have a rambling conversation with the horse pinned woman as he gives her a ride to town, the two commenting on the troubles of working for rich, ungrateful men as a grown necessity. He'll believe he might hold him up after making camp. A couple might attempt to rob him after inviting him over for dinner. A man with a snake bite might come stumbling after the woods asking him to suck the poison out. These random encounters depict a brutal life on the fading frontier, as nature pushes back against the interlopers who seek to transform it. Arthur is a perfect vessel to see it through. It's these things that make you attached to his character, and the long horse rides in the game become some more of the memorable character moments in the game. Arthur is backed up by an amazing ensemble of characters from fellow gang members like lovable Sadie Adler and the despicable Micah Bell. Even the people Arthur meets on his travels in the wide open west are some of the more memorable. Now this is what makes RDR2 my favourite, it's a game whose world, if you forgive the cliche, feels alive. Part of this is incredible writing that makes each character feel unique, and like they have a real voice and lives, 
But the other part of it is the great animators and the phenomenal voice actors that truly breathe life into each individual. Playing as part of a large gang could easily have left several characters in the background, feeling not as fleshed out at all. However, playing the game means you're liable to truly care for everyone, from Arthur to Mary Beth, John to Pearson, and every straggler you meet along the way. It's all inspiring just to walk around the world and talk to strangers, most of whom have more personality than any characters across the majority of AAA releases. Arguably the greatest villain in any Rockstar game, and one of the best in the video games period, is Dutch Vandaly. Dutch is charming, irritating, sympathetic, and, on some level, totally right. He is perfect foil because he's not a dastardly moustache twirling bad guy, even though he has the stash for it. One of the most noteworthy things that Rockstar did with Red Dead Redemption 2 is make you care about the characters. Sounds obvious, but RDR2 is a prequel to a game that kills just about every character in it. Rockstar did have an uphill battle in regards to making us care about any of Dutch's gang when we already know the fate of so many, but it does so within the first three hours. Any gamer that has played the original going on to RDR2 saw Dutch as a villain before he ever spoke. However, over the course of the first plus hour story, Rockstar Games made you laugh, cry, rage and pity along every single step with Dutch. He's so much more than a run and bad guy, his fall from grace is spectacular to be a part of and sad to witness at the same time. This is all backed up by a vast, staggeringly detailed open world. You could get out to a virtual ruler to proclaim it Rockstar's biggest yet, or count every single NPC, line of dialogue, rock, tree, and outhouse and say it's developer's dentist, but I'll leave it all for someone else. What I would say is it's Rockstar's broadest canvas since Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, quite possibly even more so, with it no longer feels like a take on a single city or state, but practically an entire country. There are the heights of Amarino, hidden under knee-deep snow, the flats of New Hanover, the bayous of Lemoyne, the opulent metropolis of Saint Denis, and the clipped greens of West Elizabeth. It's a map that offers Rockstar's take on the sights and sounds of late 19th century New Orleans through to South Carolina, from Indiana to Ira, and plenty more besides. A forged snapshot of America forever lost that is utterly convincing. It's those thousands of small details that do the convincing. The way the oil shimmers on the surface of the water that sits out from the factories of the chilly Annisburg. The cold stare and silence that meets you when you drag your scruffy frame through the saloon doors of the more cultured Saint Denis. The lamps that flicker across the midnight quiet in the town of Rhodes. The way it will keep a botanist to you, admiring the Spanish moss that hangs from the bold cypress of the bayou. The pines up in the mountains or the white oaks down on the plains. All shifting beautifully in the breeze. Even before you get to the fauna that lies underneath, it's a world that feels alive. It's in the way you'll see the weather builds overhead. Thick crops of cloud rolling over the expanse of the country. From most vantage points, the horizon is thrillingly distant, so the sky is so vast above it all. While meticulously studied clouds formations swell together. The craft that's going to Red Dead Redemption 2's world is painstaking and expansive. It's a world of vivid textures too. There's the thick mud you brawl in along the main strip of Valentine, the town where your adventure starts. The coarse lever of a coach you crafted from the wildlife you're free to hunt down. Or just the taunt hide of your horse that throws you from place to place. It's a world you have a tangible place in, thanks to Rockstar Juice again of Euphoria animation technology that shows you stumble, sprint, and collide with objects in the world, grounding you in it. That physicality, brutally, extends to your inventory system. Kill a deer and take it back to your camp and you'll sling it on the back of your horse for the ride home, watching its soft belly jostle in time with the canter. The same philosophy extends to the weapons you take with you, picked up from your horse and slung over your back. This is all a smart way of grounding you even further in Red Dead Redemption 2's world, even if, in what becomes something of a recurring theme, the elegant isn't met by deeper design, where an overly fussy rotary selection system has all your fingers and thumbs when performing the most perfunctionary task. That philosophy can be effective though. Red Dead Redemption 2's world leaves an impact on Arthur. The pointed gritty wilds muddying your horse's hide and your clothes when to either brush your ride down or pay to use a bathhouse or incur disgust in the stain of those around you. The dirt will clog up your arsenal as well, requiring you to clean your guns lest they use their potency. It's all part of the same busy work, very engaging busy work mind you in which you can maintain the length of your hair and beard or let it grow untruly, and choose to pomade it in the morning or cover it with your favourite hat. Or, 
you can get thin or fat depending on whether you overindulge in the food you're required to eat in order to maintain your stamina core. Red Dead Redemption 2 wears its RPG trappings lightly, and willfully so. It's happy, you sense, to take on a little fuzziness in order to sidestep fussiness, streamlining systems in order to keep you grounded in its world. The same approach is evident in your encounters. You can interact with every single non-player character, but your verbs are limited to simple interactions such as greet, call out, antagonize or defuse. Red Dead Redemption 2's best stories, as ever in a Rockstar game, are found in the margins. The very best to be filled out yourself. Sometimes that's just picking up environmental details and connecting the dots. The gold prospect that sifts through their hall in the middle of a river. Or, maybe something even more sinister as you pick up the trail of a serial killer. Maybe it's losing yourself in an epic hunt. There are almost 200 species here, each long in real life for you to shoot and skin and scalp. This is Rockstar's most serious drama yet, and is really, really long. The story ends after 40 to 50 hours if you're rushing, and then continues for another 10 to 15. Red Dead 2's main story missions are stubbornly typical Rockstar fear. Ride to a destination, talking all the while, do a tightly scripted albeit amusing thing, ride and track to a final destination to finish up. This is where I would have preferred a bit more variety to the approach as some of my favourite missions involve shoveling shit, getting drunk with a friend, and resolution of old romances. And the hot air balloon ride, can't forget a hot air balloon ride. Working through the more rote, stringent task is worthwhile in the end anyway, bolstered by exceptionally ambient world building characterization. Is Red Dead Redemption 2 a perfect game? No, no such thing exists. Just like there can be no perfect movie, music or TV show. Or, perhaps by its definition, must be flawed. Which say this is not a section to detail why it is the most perfect game of this generation, but why it is my favourite of this generation. Everything from the gameplay, tone, sound, design, art style, voice acting, world building, and so much more, Red Dead Redemption 2 is the most intricately handcrafted video game of all time. Most of the video games don't even come close to this level of quality and detail present here, at least not open world games. It's the rarest of rare diamonds in the industry. A jack of all trades and master of each. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a masterpiece to me and my favourite game of this generation.